Welcome back to Catalan Soccer guys, I'm Catalan Ben and today we're bringing you the ultimate match day guide for coaches. In this video we're going to be taking you through the best preparations, the apps that are going to help you and all the equipment that you're going to need to have the perfect match day prep. So let's get straight into the ultimate match day guide. guys this is quite a large guide so we've made sure that there's timestamps in the description below the video so you can skip to the point that you feel is most relevant to you whether that's equipment whether that's pre-match team talks whatever it is that you're looking for from this video if you want to watch the full guide then obviously you're free to do so but we've left the timestamps there so you can skip to the best bit if you need it first of all guys i'm a big believer that the match day starts before match day so preparation and planning is a really important part of your coaching what you need to do is get yourself some team management apps. There's lots of free ones out there. Some of my favorite ones are Spond and Haya and lots of other apps that you guys can find on the App Store very easily. These apps aren't sponsoring the video in any way. They're just my personal favorites that I use. These free apps that you can find out there do a fantastic job. They've got everything you need, so don't waste your money. Team management apps are really useful for monitoring absences, for letting people know dates, times, and changes to any kickoffs and to keep you updated with who's gonna attend your training or your matches. We've all been there, we've been caught out as a coach because kids didn't turn up that you were expecting to be there or you're expecting 20 kids and only five turned up. So these team management apps help keep parents and coaches in the loop at all times. Next, we're going to look at equipment. And equipment is really important, so we're going to break it down into a few different categories for what you're going to need. So first of all, it's coaching equipment. And top of my list is my trusty notepad for all my ideas, my session plans, and just making sure that I've always got somewhere to write something down. So get a notepad. You can buy a generic one that's just lined paper, or you can get ones that have got team plans and sessions built into them, and you can have a look online for great soccer coaching planners. Next on the list for coaching equipment is a tactics board. You need a tactics board. You have to have one. It's the most important part of coaching for visual learners. So you need to make sure that you have some markers. You need to make sure you've got some pens and make sure you've got a good size tactics board that you can use. There's hundreds available online. You can buy very expensive ones or a cheap and, and quick and easy one. It's up to you, but make sure you've got a tactics board, magnetic markers and a pen. And the final thing for my coaching list is a clipboard or folder. I always make sure I've got a clipboard to hand for pieces of paper, registration documents, anything you might need to take to a game or someone might give you. So make sure you've got a clipboard in your bag. The next category for equipment is well-being equipment. Make sure you've got water bottles for all your players so you can keep them hydrated. They're useful for injuries and obviously pre-match and at half time. I like to keep hot and cold packs in my bag in case of injuries. It might be that a player with an injury needs an ice pack or a cool pack that's not actually going to freeze their skin, but is going to take swelling down on a twisted ankle or a knock to the knee or something like that. So make sure you've got hot and cold packs in your bag just in case of any injuries. And the last equipment list is for the match itself. So the first thing you're going to need is match balls and training balls. I always try to make sure that there's at least one ball per child so that I can do warm-ups where every child's got a ball. But if you're not lucky enough to be able to spend all that money, then make sure there's at least half the number of balls for the number of players for passing practices and to make sure there's always spare footballs available. For match balls, I recommend having two or three. One might end up going in a bush, one might end up going flat during the game. So don't have just one match ball. Try and always make sure you've got a couple. Speaking of flat balls, make sure you've got a pump, electric pumps that connect to the car are the fastest, but the easiest and cheapest ones are the small handheld pumps that you can get online for less than £10, but make sure your ball does not go flat because you've got a pump to hand. If you're the home team, you may need to set up a respect barrier and your club should be providing this, or you may have to get one yourself, but make sure there's a barrier on the same side as all the spectators to keep them the right distance from the pitch and maintain that respect line. To mark out areas of the pitch, like halfway lines or corners, make sure you've got either corner flags or slalom poles that can be used to make it very clear where the corners of the pitch are and the halfway line. Really helps for referees and the kids too. And finally, just in case of any kick clashes and to help you in part of your warm-up, make sure you've got bibs. I usually go with two different colours for the warm-up and then there's always one colour that you can use for your matches just in case two teams turn up in the same colour. Now the last few are luxury items. These aren't necessarily things you have to have on a match day, but they are quite cool to have. The first one is a subs bench. You can buy these fold out benches that pop out very easily and are a great place to keep kids so they're not sat on the floor or if you've got an injured player, they can sit down on the bench. It's good for managers too to give those legs a rest. 
The next one is a tent. Now this can be great in adverse weather or if you're at an all day tournament, it can be really good to pick up a cheap pop-up tent that kids can sit in to stay out of the sun or stay out of the rain. And finally, just like I'm using now, a camera with a tripod can be helpful too to film your warm-ups or your matches. Make sure you've got permission to do so before you start filming, but if you want to make sure you're giving good analysis and feedback to your players, then filming your matches and your sessions can be really useful. The next section is pre-match team talks, a very important part of coaching and making sure that your players are focused and concentrating on the right things before the first ball is kicked. The way that I plan my pre-match team talks is first of all to go through the environment. Is it a windy day? Are we playing uphill? Is the pitch particularly muddy or boggy which is going to catch out players who carry the ball and dribble? Or is it a slick wet pitch that's going to allow us to pass the ball quickly? Is it a bumpy bobbly pitch where players are going to need to use the studs and the sole of their foot more often than normal because of that bobble? I take all these things into consideration and make sure that's part of the explanation to the kids and ask them to feed back to me. What do you think the environment is like today? Give me some words, give me some ideas as to what the environment is like and then we'll talk about how that environment is going to affect how we play. The next part of my team talk is going to be about tempo. Now you need to try and set a precedent before the match starts to get your players off to a fast start. I've got a really good warm up that I like to use for, to get players off to a fast start. Check out the link just above me here so you can watch that video. But regardless of the warm up that you go with, you need to make sure that it's match realistic, that the ball moves quickly and we make sure we get the kids in that tempoed, fast starting activity. Once the kids come out of that activity and then you come into your pre-match team talk, you need to keep that up. You need to remind them about the essence of why we've just done that particular speed activity. You need to remind them of the importance of how conceding the first goal or scoring the first goal can make a huge difference to the game. So let's try and get on that front foot, try and be the team that scores the first goal with a nice quick start. Just like in my previous videos about how to plan sessions, keep your pre-match team talks with two or three clear messages that you want the kids to try and input into the game. Don't overload them, don't talk for 15 minutes, they will switch off, they'll stop listening and they'll forget more than they'll remember. Keep things short, punchy and concise and most importantly make sure that your messages are easy to remember and easy to repeat back to you. As an additional tip, make sure the kids are kept away from distractions. There could be a parent trying to talk to them over their shoulder. It could be that there's a dog running around. It could be loads of different things on a grassroots Sunday. But try and get the kids in an area and a mindset that's focused on what you're saying. This is where the equipment list that we went through earlier becomes really important because your tactics board should now be out with the players. Make sure they understand their roles and responsibilities. They understand exactly where each player is going to be playing. And most importantly, they understand how they're going to act when they're playing in those positions. You need to go through behaviours, you need to go through responsibilities in terms of defending and attacking and using that tactics board either to write things down or to illustrate them with markers will really help your kids get a grasp of their jobs. I always like to refer back to our last game or last performance during our pre-match team talk. It might be that you've just come off the back of a heavy defeat and there's a bit of motivation that you need to take from that. There's a few lessons that you learned that you went through in your post-match team talk after the game and that needs to form part of your pre-match team talk now. It could be that you've just come back off a really, really good, positive performance and you've scored lots of goals, you've played some really good football and you need to give this kid some reminders of what you did so well in the last game and bring that through into today's performance as well. And finally is the opposition. Now, the opposition could be a complete unknown. You've never played them before. You don't know what to expect. If that's the case, then make sure that the kids are playing pragmatic football. They don't go too crazy. They're not too naive. And they try and control the ball and control possession as much as they can whilst they figure out the other team. That stops your kids getting caught cold from a very quick team or a team that come out the blocks fast that you weren't aware of how they were going to play. Or your opposition could be a team that you've played before. You might have even played fairly recently because sometimes fixtures stack up and you play the same team within a matter of weeks of each other. So if there's any reference that you can make to a previous game, that might help the kids in their preparations. But don't focus too much and for too long on the opposition because essentially that's something that's harder for your kids to control. Try and make sure you're focusing on what you can control and what the kids can control and make sure that's their main focus as part of that pre-match team talk.
Now, following on from the point I made earlier about how the match day starts before the match day, it's important that you let your players know who's going to be playing, what positions they're going to be playing in, maybe who's going to be starting a substitute before the game. One of the most common mistakes that I see coaches make is they arrive at the game and the kids haven't got a clue which position they're going to be playing, if they're even starting the game, and what their roles and responsibilities are going to be. And then, five minutes before kickoff, the coach hits them with that information where it's very difficult for kids to get their head round, where it's very short periods for kids to be able to understand their roles. And if a kid has just found out they're going to be substitute, they could be really disheartened before the game starts. If they found out two or three days prior, it gives them a bit of time to prep themselves mentally for starting a sub and for you to chat with them about how they're going to start the game. But if you leave everything till the last minute, don't expect your kids to put on a peak performance and play really well or full of confidence because they could be playing in a position that they don't want to be or that they weren't prepared to be playing in before the match. So give them as much notice as you can on their positions and their responsibilities. Now, once the game starts, there's lots of different schools of thought for the best things to do or the best way to act during the game. I'm going to take you through my personal preference. I'm not saying this is right or wrong or the other ways that you might do it can't be good too. But this is just the way that I personally try and coach my kids once the game is being played. First of all, I try and encourage kids to make good decisions rather than just give them instructions. In the same way that if my little boy was struggling with his maths homework, I wouldn't give him all the answers, but I also wouldn't just leave him to his own devices and hope that he could just work it out himself. What I would do is give him some guided discovery and help him see the right methods or make the right choices to hopefully get the right answer more often than not. So my preferred way of coaching once the game starts is to try and ask kids to make the right decisions. I'll ask them questions like, can you find the right winger? Who's available? Who's in the best space? Can you play a pass that breaks through and breaks a line? Can you find our striker? Is there a switch available? I'm asking those kind of questions, which are prompts to try and help kids discover and find the right answers, but I'm not giving them the information every single time and saying, do this, do this, do that. What you'll find is that by guiding their decision-making, they will gradually start to make better decisions on their own, and your team will then play more autonomously without you having to make those decisions for them. But don't forget, not every coach is going to prefer coaching in that style. So find the style that suits you best. I personally find that guided decision making with some instructions, especially at the start, will help kids make the right decisions. And then gradually, as they get older, as they get smarter, as they start playing in better ways and with better decisions, then I take a little bit of a step back. And then my chats are more just around half time, full time and having that chat before the game. Now, speaking of halftime, let's talk through a halftime team talk. Now, obviously, this can go a few different ways depending on the current scoreline, depending on how your kids are playing. And there's lots of variables. So I'm just going to give you a few tips and tricks for how to make sure that your kids are engaged and listening regardless of what you say. I can't give you the perfect team talk because it will depend on your kids. It will depend on individuals. It depends on the team collective, on the scoreline and the situation that your kids find themselves in. But one of my first tips is to be animated in your team talk. That might be animated as in drawing on your tactics board. It might be animated as in moving and demonstrating how you want the kids to play and how you want them to act during the game. You and an assistant coach or you and another kid might do a little demonstration when you're saying, I want to play more one-twos. Don't just say one-twos, show them what a one-two looks like. By getting animated either with the tactics board or visually by you moving, it will keep kids engaged in your team talk. The next tip is to pick the right tone. It might be that you need to be calm and quiet and collected when you're speaking to the kids. It might be that you need to be a bit more fast and energetic and upbeat if you're trying to get that kind of response out of the kids. So pick the right tone based on how you want your kids to be performing in the match. Do you see how I'm using different pacing to try and get a different result in the words that I'm saying? So even though the words that I'm saying are the same, the way that I pace it and the way that I try to get it across to the kids will have a direct impact on whether the kids are listening and how they respond to that message. So if you're trying to get a really fast, up-tempo start to the second half, don't do it with a really slow, droll and monotone voice. Try and do it with short, sharp, punchy messages. That will hopefully get the kids to buy into that tempo that you want them to use in the game. 
And the final tip from me on halftime team talks is to go through the positives. There's lots of ways that you could look back at the first half and focus on the mistakes or errors or individual things that might have cost you a goal or two or might have cost you possession. But what I like to do, especially at a young age group, is really focus on what we got right. Were we well organised? Did specific players carry out their role very, very well? And we can use them as a role model for the other players on the pitch to try and copy what they've done. What was the effort like? Was it really good? Was it really high? Were we trying to do the right things? Were the ideas the right things to do? So even if we tried to do the right thing 50 times and it failed, let's focus on the fact we were all trying to do the right things. So focus on the positives, find as many positives as you can from the first half, and guess what? We're going to try and replicate those in that second half. And then we come to the post-match team talk. Again, completely dependent on how your team has played, on how the scoreline has affected the game and how your kids will be feeling after the match. So I'm going to give you a couple of top tips based on two scenarios, the win and the loss. When kids come off the pitch after a loss, it can be hard to pick kids back up. And sometimes for certain kids, right after the final whistle isn't the right time to talk to them about what to improve on or what they need to fix. Kids aren't in the right frame of mind, they're probably not listening, and they're not in a receptive mindset. If they're not there right now, then maybe now isn't the time to go through all the things you want them to improve on the next game. Now's the time actually to pat the kids on the back, say good effort, good try, well played, you tried to do X, Y, and Z, I was happy with these particular things, and the things that we didn't get right, we'll focus on in the next training session or before the next game. But I'm sure you've all been there where you've been in a team talk, talking to the top of a kid's head because his chin's down on his chest and he's not really listening to a word you say. All the constructive criticism, all the praise that you try and give him, probably is just going to wash over him and he's not going to be receptive to it. So instead, pick your moment, whether to try and go through everything that we got wrong and everything we need to improve on or to accept that maybe now's not the right time, just after a game's finished, just after the kids have lost, Let's have a chat about it before the next match or before the next training session or at the next training session. Now, if individual kids or your team have come off the pitch after a loss, but are still quite receptive, they're still in fairly good spirits and they know that it was quite a close game and they played quite well, then that can still be a time that you can go through and talk about the things to improve on, the errors or the individual things that might have gone wrong, lapses in concentration and things like that. But just be aware and read the body language of the kids for what mindset they're in before you start on that post-match team talk. Don't just be blindfolded into thinking, I have to go through everything that the kids got wrong right now because the game's just finished. That's not always the right time to speak to the kids. So gauge that body language. If the kids look receptive, if the kids look like they want to learn and they want to listen to what you've got to say, then that's the time to talk through the errors, mistakes and the positives and go through them after the game. Now the win, now usually the wins are the easiest team talks to have, but it's not that they can't be learning and outcomes that you try to get from the post-match team talk even after a win. So like we said previously, let's try and focus on some of the positives. How did we create chances? Where did the goals come from? Where did we manufacture success in the game based on things that we've done in training? So if I've been working on short corners in my training sessions and then we score from a short corner, I'm giving the kids a massive big well done because they put that training into practice. Were there any individual performances that really stood out? And I don't just mean give out a man of the match, that's pretty typical, but let's still, even if you're giving out a man of the match, give out a few pats on the back for a great defensive display. Did your keeper make a really big save that kept you in the game? Try and focus on a few individuals or maybe even give out a positive to every individual in the team, something you were happy with from them or something you liked about what they did today. Go through the entire team and say, you were great for this, you did excellent for that, I'm proud of you for this. Then if you want to pick a man of the match off the back of that, there's a few different ways you could do it. Some coaches will get the opposition manager to pick a man of the match. Some coaches will get the kids to pick who they thought was the man of the match and do a team vote. Or you might just pick one yourself if you think there was an absolute outstanding player. That's fine too. Now for that post-match team talk, I always like to call the parents over so that the parents can, one, hear what we're saying, two, listen to the positives and the well-dones and all the great things that you're saying about what the boys have just done. And then on the other side of the pitch, behind the respect bar barrier, miles away from the team talk and all the positives that you're giving out. So if you're trying to get parents to reinforce what you're saying, whether that's in the car on the way home or at your sessions and at, and at home when they're talking about their football, then knowing what you're, you're saying to your kids, knowing the post-match team talk and how that went can really help parents reinforce those messages with you. 
and bringing the parents over at the end when you give out that man of the match, when all the parents and all the players together are giving out a big round of applause, that can really help that man of the match feel great because there's a big audience there that they're in front of when they're given that award. So another reason to bring the parents over into your team talks. And the way that I like to finish my team talks with the parents all stood around and after we've given out our well dones, our praise, our man of the matches and our constructive criticism if there's anything to go through is then I always remind the kids at the end in terms of respect and in terms of setting those high standards. I say, guys, what do we need to say to mums and dads for bringing us to the session, for bringing us to the games, for standing on the sideline in the rain or the baking sun or wherever they've been. I always say, don't forget what do we need to say to the parents now and make the kids shout a big thank you to mums and dads. I think it's very important that kids appreciate what the mums and dads are providing and the opportunity that they've been given that a lot of other kids don't get because their mums and dads are willing to put them there. So give out a big thank you to the mums and dads at the end of the match. Post game day. Now I know this is a match day guide, but the post match day can be really important too. And post match day, I go for a few different things. I like to film a lot of my games, so I'll go back through the footage and just analyze if there's anywhere where we were consistently getting things wrong, if there's any patterns that I want to try and change, or just a bit of opposition revision for the next game on what they did well and help us in the next match. I also like to send out a nice message Again, on those team management apps that we talked about earlier in the video, send a nice message out to the parents, thanking them for one, attending, two, for any help that they gave you on the match day, and a big thanks and shout out to the kids for good performances, for goals, assists, everything else that you, know, you want to celebrate on that message after the game. And one of the final things that I do post-match is then I like to send a message to the opposition manager. You might be thanking them for their conduct. It might be a big well done to their team for how they played and what they did. You might have noticed a few things that you want to try and incorporate into your team's play based on how they did it, whether it be short corners or slick passing or great defending or whatever it is. It might just be a nice message to the opposition manager as a little well done and a thank you for a great game. That always goes down well. It sets a nice little rapport between you and opposition managers. And next time you meet them, I'm sure you'll meet them with a smile and a handshake because of that message. So keep respect, keep everything nice and positive between you and the opposition, whether you've won or lost. So there you have it, guys, the ultimate match day guide for anything that you might have to worry or think about before, during and after a match day. We hope you found this guide useful. If you did, please leave a like on the video. Please subscribe to the channel. It really helps us to make more great coaching content that we've got coming soon. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye.